everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this webinar. Uh, my name is Karen Lee and I am hosting uh, our really exciting talk tonight about keratoconus and cataract surgery. Um, just to remind you all, we are here because of the National Keratoconus Foundation. They are a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to uh, educating the public about the condition keratoconus. Now tonight, we actually have four very exciting speakers. Um, we have Dr. Les Bader and his three ophthalmology residents, Dr. El Sarag, Biako, and Naidu. Um, Dr. Les Bader, he is the Physician Executive Director of the Department of Ophthalmology for MedStar Health. He is also the Director of Cornea and Refractive Surgery and President of the Washington National Eye Center. He's very accomplished, written 50 uh, papers and abstracts, and most recently, he actually won a professional service award in 2023, where he was uh, preventing blindness in the metropolitan Washington uh, area. And so I'm really excited to hear this talk because I feel like with keratoconus patients, everyone panics when they think about surgery, and not every keratoconus patient will go through the same types of surgery, whether it's cross-linking or a cornea transplant. But one commonality is if we all get old enough, we're probably all going to need cataract surgery at some point. And so I'm really excited to just hear this talk and take it away, you guys. Good luck. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for that introduction. And thank you to the Keratoconus Foundation for asking us to speak this evening. Um, we will be covering um, several topics. We'll be talking about cataracts in general, about cataract surgery, and throughout specifically how, how all of those impact keratoconus patients in particular. As Dr. Lee mentioned, we're very fortunate to have three of our outstanding resident physicians here this evening who will each be doing part of the presentation and um, Dr. Fiaco will be kicking it off for us. Thank you, Dr. Lesbader, and uh, thank you everyone for having us tonight. Um, so to talk about cataracts, uh, particularly when it, with regard to keratoconus, the first thing to do is just talk about exactly what a cataract is. Uh, so a cataract is a clouding of the natural crystalline lens in the eye. The lens that you're born with is uh, usually supposed to be nice and clear so that light can go through, uh, create a nice image for your brain to, uh, to see. But over time, the lens can become more cloudy for a lot of reasons that we'll talk about. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so to talk about a cataract, to talk about the lens within the eye, we should talk about the structure of the eye. How is it made up? Where does the lens sit uh, with regard to all the other structures? So um, I'll talk about it with regard to light and how it gets from the front of the eye to the back of the eye, all the way to the brain to make a nice picture. Uh, light enters the eye through the cornea, the very front part of the eye, which uh, all of you are very familiar with. Uh, keratoconus, is, this is what keratoconus affects. It then goes uh, through the lens and after going through the lens, it hits the retina and focuses on the retina, and that sends a signal through the optic nerve to the brain to make an image that we see. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So the purpose of the lens is to uh, work alongside the cornea, the tear film, to focus light onto the retina. If the retina is like the film of the camera, the cornea and the lens are like the lenses of the camera. Um, the cornea does the majority of the focusing power of the eye. It works alongside the tear film on the surface of the cornea. And then all that light after passing through and being focused by those two structures goes through the, uh, through the uh, what is supposed to be a clear lens and focuses onto the retina. Go to the next slide. So what happens when that lens becomes cloudy? Well, that's what we call a cataract. So again, Usually at, at the beginning of life, we're born with a very nice clear lens that light can pass through easily. And then over time, for many reasons, that lens becomes cloudy. Uh, so light can still enter through the tear film, through the cornea, but it has trouble entering through the cataract, which was the lens. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so that causes light to be blocked and scattered. It's almost like looking through a cloudy window. It can cause a lot of symptoms, cloudy vision, it can cause glare, particularly at night with lights. Um, it can cause de decreased contrast sensitivity, so colors might not appear as sharp as they once did. We can go to the next slide. Um, so how do these form? The most common form of cataract is that associated with aging. It's when the natural proteins within the lens start to break down. 
uh, and that breaks down the, the natural clarity of the lens. But there are other risk factors for developing cataracts, uh, particularly earlier in life. These can include diabetes, exposure to sun, steroids, radiation, traumas, eye surgeries, and smoking. And when I say eye surgeries, I primarily mean surgeries that happen inside of the eye. So uh, a great example of that would be a penetrating keratoplasty in the instance of keratoconus or any other intraocular surgery. Um, corneal cross-linking, another procedure that many of you are familiar with, is a surgery that doesn't take place inside of the eye, and therefore it's not been shown to actually increase the risk of cataract formation. Go to the next slide. Um, so how common are cataracts in keratoconus patients? Uh, well, actually, cataracts develop largely at the same rate to the general population of patients without keratoconus. Um, that is in the absence of having a surgery inside of the eye, like I mentioned. So if, uh, if you've had a surgery like a corneal transplant previously or any other surgery inside of the eye, the likelihood of having a cataract early in life does go up. Can go to the next slide. So what do we do for cataracts? Currently, the only treatment for cataracts is a surgery that happens in an operating room that Drs. Naidu and El Sarag will talk about. Um, the eyes with keratoconus tend to have irregular corneas, and this can affect a lot of aspects of the planning for cataract surgery, causing some challenges uh, that make the surgery more uh, technically challenging and uh, require more planning ahead of time. This is things that include measuring all of the, uh, the corneal structure preoperatively, determining which lens implant is best for the eye, different surgical techniques to uh, account for the fact that the cornea may be irregular, and then following up with good post-operative care. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Naidu to talk a little bit more about the cataract surgery planning and surgery itself. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having us here today. And thank you, Dr. Fiaco, for setting the stage. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit more about the specifics of cataract surgery in patients with keratoconus. So before we even consider cataract surgery, we always want to determine the stage and the stability of the disease itself. So there are a few ways we can determine the stage. The Berlin ABCD is sort of a, a newer method of grading, which uses some measurements from the Oculus Pentacam. Some of you may have heard about the Pentacam. It's used to basically take a whole bunch of measurements of the cornea. I have a picture on the next slide to show you about that. And older patients with keratoconus tend to have more stable disease than younger patients. And this is a good thing because obviously we want very stable disease to proceed with surgery because that way the lens that we implant is gonna be the right lens and it's not gonna change over time. And corneal cross-linking can obviously be used to slow or halt disease progression in mild to moderate cases. Next slide. So before we take a patient to cataract surgery, we have to take preoperative measurements. And this is important, obviously, because we need to implant the right intraocular lens into their eye. Um, this is unfortunately a problem in patients with keratoconus, or it can be a big problem sometimes, especially when the disease is more advanced. So keratometry is a measurement of the corneal power and this is done using an Oculus Pentacam, and there's other devices on the market as well. The picture on the right here is a Pentacam output, and essentially it looks like a heat map of the cornea, and it spits out a lot of information, a lot of measurements which we can take into account. Some of you have probably seen something like this before. Um, I'd like you to actually look at the top left image. That's probably the most important one that we look at. And you can see that little area of red that's sort of at the bottom. That actually shows steepening of the cornea. So that's an area of the cornea that's a little bit more cone-shaped, a little bit thinner, and that's sort of characteristic finding we can see in keratoconus. So some of these measurements are affected by patients that have keratoconus, and these measurements um, unfortunately start to you know, deviate from the norm. And things like irregular tear films, difficulty fixating at targets, and the corneal steepening all tend to affect these measurements. Patients with keratoconus also tend to have longer axial lengths, Axial length is actually just the, the distance of uh, the length of the eye, and that's a measurement that we also take into account for cataract surgery. Next slide. So a lot of patients with keratoconus do wear contact lenses, and contact lenses can actually temporarily warp the structure of the cornea and affect measurements. So a very important consideration is that we need to actually stop contact lens wear for a certain period of time, 
before we can proceed with taking these measurements. For just as a general guideline, for soft contact lenses, it's about three days, two weeks for toric lenses that correct for astigmatism, and three weeks for rigid gas permeable lenses. Next slide. So the lens that we implant called an intraocular lens has many different powers. And to determine what power to put in, um, there's a whole bunch of calculations that we take a look at. Uh, biometry is actually the process of measuring the power of the cornea and the length of the eye and using these measurements together to determine what lens to implant. Um, there's actually many formulas that have sort of uh, evolved over the years and changed. And there's no best formula that we can use. It all depends on sort of the severity of the disease, the interpretation of these preoperative measurements, and the surgeon's clinical judgment, and of course, of course, the patient's best interest and best wishes. So we take all this into account when determining what lens to implant. Next slide. So this little picture here is um, a picture of an intraocular lens. So you can see how small it is. This is the lens that we put into the eye after we take out the cataract. Different type of lenses exist, the three main being monofocal, multifocal, and toric. So traditionally, monofocal lenses are, have been the standard of choice. These lenses help to correct for a certain distance. Um, and you, we usually correct for so that patients are able to see far away without requiring glasses. Multifocal lenses, which actually correct for different distances, so both at distance and at near. However, they're not always recommended in patients that have keratoconus because there's an increased risk of higher order aberrations. Higher order aberrations can be thought of as sort of small subjective issues with vision that people notice things like glare, halos, and other other things sort of similar to that. And it can also be, it can also cause some residual refractive error, even after we try to get the best measurements. A toric lens, which can correct for astigmatism, can be a reasonable choice in some patients with keratoconus. However, there, there needs to be sort of more studies to help determine the right patients that are, are good candidates for this sort of lens. Next slide. So when actually talking about surgical considerations, um, we always look at the cornea and, patient, and we always think about patients with keratoconus as an important factor when, when navigating the eye and, and uh, with all these technical considerations during surgery. Um, so for example, when we make our initial incision into the cornea, um, we know that it can cause astigmatism. So we definitely take a patient's astigmatism from keratoconus into account when we're making that incision. Um, we also like to look at any scarring that might be there and use that to help determine where the best place for incision will be. Sometimes a, a corneal scarring can actually lead to difficulty visualizing the rest of the eye. So there's certain um, tools and certain actually devices we can use to help improve that visualization. One of the things we use actually in almost all cataract surgery is something called viscoelastic devices. These, uh, you can think of it sort of as injecting almost honey or viscous substances into the eye, which help to create more space for us to work and also help to coat important structures, specifically the cornea to help prevent any damage from occurring during the surgery. We can also use something called tripen blue. It's actually a dye, which you can see in this picture here. It helps to stain the capsule, which is the bag that the cataract sits in. And it, we essentially need to open up that bag so we can get to the cataract. And if the cornea is scarred or the keratoconus makes the visualization difficult, it really helps to um, see it really well. And you can see in the image that that capsular bag is, is very well seen. And that way, you know, it makes it much safer just to get the best outcome possible. Um, lastly, there's certain steps, including phaco emulsification. That's where we use ultrasound to break up the cataract and sort of vacuum it out. Um, it creates a lot of energy and that energy sort of gets dispersed throughout the eye. And in patients with keratoconus, we obviously want to protect the cornea as much as possible. So that's always something that's in, on, on the top of our minds when we're doing surgery. Next slide. Also wanted to talk briefly about something called the triple procedure. This is essentially a combination of a corneal transplant, removal of a cataract, and implantation of an intraocular lens. So, you know, it sounds like a, a lot, and it is because not all patients are good candidates for it. It's a, a very lengthy procedure, which you know, may have good outcomes, but can also have very, it can have outcomes that are unexpected. There are some patients that actually might benefit from a triple procedure. Um, these include patients that are likely to develop corneal swelling after cataract surgery, when corneal surgery may actually accelerate the development of a cataract, as Dr. Fiaco had mentioned. 
or when corneal scarring is just so significant that we, that we have to take out both the cataract and do the corneal transplant. Obviously, the advantage of this trip or procedure is that, you know, we every, the patient just gets one trip to the operating room. And although we're surgeons, you know, we like to limit how often patients need to go to the operating room. We like to do it as, with as minimal, you know, stress to the patient as possible. It allows for quicker visual rehabilitation. But of course, you know, one of the drawbacks is that the IOL power that we implant can be very difficult to predict. Usually we like to do the corneal transplant first and then get measurements for the cataract. But if that's not possible, we have to use, you know, the best measure that we can and the best estimate that we can in order to get the best outcome. And uh, with that, I'm actually gonna hand it over to Dr. Elsarag to talk a little bit more about the outcomes of cataract surgery. All righty, thank you so much, Dr. Naidu and Dr. Fiaco. I'm Dr. Elsarag, it's nice to meet everyone and thank you all so much for having me. So after surgery, I wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of what the recovery looks like after cataract surgery and then what are some um, expectations that patients with keratoconus can have and what are some commonly encountered complications that we see after cataract surgery. So the cataract surgery itself is a same day surgery, meaning that you uh, go to the operating room. Surgery usually lasts between 30 to 60 minutes um, and then you go home the same day. Um, and your doctor will usually see you the day after surgery, the week after surgery, and then one month after cataract surgery. The day after surgery, the vision is usually going to be blurry, uh, and that's because the eye still needs time to heal right after the surgery. So right after cataract surgery, there's usually a little bit of swelling in the cornea and inflammation in the eye, and both of those contribute to the vision being blurry. On the first day after cataract surgery, Really, we are just trying to make sure that patients are comfortable and that the eye pressure is controlled. Um, and then the vision usually will begin to recover in the uh, coming days. About one week after surgery, um, usually patients can expect to be about 80% you know, healed or so. At that point, most of the swelling in the cornea will have resolved. Most of the inflammation uh, will hide it down. And then after that, um, Patients are seen one month after surgery, and at this point, the um, your surgeon will do a dilated eye exam to look at the retina, uh, and then at this point also, um, new glasses uh, will be measured. All right, so after surgery, um, patients use several different eye drops to help the healing process. Uh, patients will use an antibiotic eye drop for the first week. This helps to decrease the risk of infection. And then either one or two anti-inflammatory eye drops for four weeks after surgery. Now those eye drops are usually used four times a day, sometimes more, but usually four times a day for the first week. And then um, they're usually gradually tapered down um, uh, so that they're stopped one month after surgery. All right. Um, I wanted to discuss a little bit about the combined cataract and corneal transplant procedure. So the healing of this is a little bit different. Um, like Dr. Naidu mentioned earlier, it is a little bit bigger surgery, so the healing takes longer. After the corneal transplant, um, for the first few days, we're just trying to ensure the patients are comfortable. We want to make sure that there's no leakage of fluid from the eye because the um, a new transplanted cornea is sutured in, um, and those sutures um, should be preventing any leakage of fluid from the eye. Uh, and then similarly, patients use um, antibiotic eye drops and steroids to decrease the risk of infection. One week after a surgery like this, um, we are waiting to see um, for the epithelium to heal. So the epithelium is the, you can think of it kind of as the skin of the cornea. Um, and in the transplanted cornea, that usually takes a little bit of time to heal, oftentimes up to several weeks uh, for that to fully heal. And then similarly, we're keeping um, uh, a watch on the patient's um, eye pressures uh, and comfort. And so this is kind of a picture of what um, that process looks like um, for the corneal healing. Um, the green areas here are areas where the uh, corneal epithelium is not fully healed. And then you can see gradually over the course of a few weeks um, that'll heal up. And again, this is only something that happens um, if there's a corneal transplant in addition to cataract surgery. So this is not um, part of the recovery for just standalone cataract surgery. And then at the one month mark after uh, corneal transplant and cataract surgery, 
Um, we're keeping a watch on the pressure again. We are um, decreasing that steroid eye drop. That is the anti-inflammatory eye drop and also helps to protect against rejection. And then usually the um, clarity of the cornea is improving at that point and there's improvement uh, in the vision. Um, so uh, recovery after the combined procedure does take a little bit longer than um, uh, regular cataract surgery alone. Um, if there is a corneal transplant, then um, the sutures that are used to uh, attach the transplant to um, the eye can cause some astigmatism. Um, now, normally in regular cataract surgery, there is a small wound in the eye through which the surgery is completed and through which the uh, lens is introduced, but that wound is usually quite small, um, and usually we don't need any sutures to uh, close that wound. And so um, usually there's no um, need for you know, removing sutures uh, after just regular uh, standalone cataract surgery. But if there is a corneal transplant, then over the coming weeks, your surgeon will gradually begin to remove those um, stitches and that can help to reduce the uh, amount of astigmatism. Now, astigmatism is um, a big deal for patients who have um, keratoconus and so how do we manage astigmatism after cataract surgery? So um, if the surgeon introduced a toric lens in the eye, that's the astigmatism correcting lens, that can help to reduce how much astigmatism there is in the post-operative period. Um, and after surgery, patients may have um, a, only a small amount of astigmatism. That said, um, in patients who have keratoconus, a lot of the astigmatism is what we call irregular astigmatism. So that's astigmatism that cannot be corrected simply by using glasses or simply by placing a toric lens in the eye. Um, and so um, this is where contact lenses come in. And um, most patients with keratoconus are going to be you know, familiar with wearing contact lenses. And so um, if there is a high amount of irregular astigmatism, um, or just a high amount of astigmatism that cannot be completely corrected with a toric lens or completely corrected with glasses, um, and then patients um, will have um, a new prescription for their contact lenses measured. And so most patients who are in contact lenses before cataract surgery um, should expect to stay in contact lenses um, after cataract surgery uh, as well. And there's different types of lenses. Um, most patients with keratoconus are gonna be using the rigid gas permeable lenses. Soft lenses um, do not help to correct as much of the irregular astigmatism. And then scleral lenses are also an option uh, for some patients who uh, maybe don't tolerate the rigid gas permeable lenses as well. So what are some of the complications that we can have after cataract surgery? So in general, cataract surgery is a very successful operation. Um, it's the, the most commonly performed surgery in the United States. Uh, you know, we have millions of cataract surgeries performed uh, every year. And um, overall, you know, usually within a few weeks after surgery, patients are, are fully healed and are seeing much better. Um, but like any surgery, there are risks of different complications. And so I just wanted to uh, briefly go over some of the more common complications that can occur after um, cataract surgery. So one of those complications is what we call rebound iritis. Now the iris is the colored part of the eye, so the brown part or the blue part or green part of the eye, depending on the color of the eye. And iritis means inflammation uh, in that part of the eye. And a little bit of inflammation always occurs after cataract surgery, just from the manipulation of tissues in the eye and the introduction of instruments in the eye. But usually that inflammation fully heals um, within about four weeks or so after surgery. Some patients can have a recurrence of that inflammation and we call that rebound iritis. And so that will usually present with symptoms like pain, redness, light sensitivity, and decreased vision. Um, and we're not entirely sure why um, patients uh, have rebound iritis. Sometimes it can be because of a lot of energy used during the initial surgery. Occasionally there can be small fragments of the cataract um, left in the eye and the inflammation is basically the body's way of kind of getting rid of those small fragments of surgery uh, or small fragments of the lens. Um, but in any case, um, we treat patients with rebound iritis with anti-inflammatory eye drops. Uh, and so that'll be the steroid eye drop um, that we use. And um, almost all patients will, um, the, the inflammation can be controlled just by using uh, eye drops alone. And usually it heals over the course of a few weeks. One of the other complications uh, that can occur after cataract surgery is posterior capsule opacification. 
Um, so when we put the lens in the eye, it actually goes behind the colored part of the eye into a structure that we call the capsular bag. And the capsular bag, a lot of people think of it kind of like the shell of an M&M. And that capsular bag is um, suspended to the walls of the eye um, through little threads called zonular fibers. So that's what holds it in place. And we place the um, intraocular lens implant within that capsular bag. Um, and so in these pictures, um, you can see the um, kind of whitish color of the capsular bag. Now, in some patients after cataract surgery, um, normally that um, capsular bag is clear, but sometimes over the course of months or years after surgery, gradually the capsule behind the lens called the posterior capsule can undergo a process that we call opacification. So it loses that initial clarity um, and it causes the vision to become uh, hazy uh, or foggy. And a lot of patients think of this as sort of like a recurrence of the um, original cataract. And although it's not, not quite, you know, the cataract necessarily coming back, it can have those same effects on the vision. And so the way we treat this is by using a laser to remove or sort of polish that posterior capsule. And so during the laser procedure, we would basically kind of create an opening getting rid of all of this sort of whitish opacified capsule to try and improve the clarity of the vision. And that's something that is done in the office. Um, it's a fast procedure uh, with um, usually very quick results and, and minimal recovery. Um, the exact rate of the posterior capsule opacification does depend a little bit on the type of lens that was placed in the eye and, and some other factors. Um, one of the other common complications that we can see after cataract surgery is cystoid macular edema. Um, so that's um, a bit of a mouthful. The macula is the uh, center of the retina. Um, and the macula is the most important part of the retina because that's what's responsible for our very crisp and clear central vision. Um, and so edema is swelling in the macula. And this is a picture um, using a technology that we call optical coherence tomography. And this takes a sort of a cross section um, using uh, beams of light um, of the macula and uh, potentially of different parts of the retina. And we can see here in this, um, uh, this OCT that there are these sort of black spaces um, in the center uh, of the macula and a little bit underneath uh, the macula. And so that's all accumulation of fluid and we call that cystoid macular edema. And so patients will notice um, a decrease in their central vision and um, a distortion of the central vision. So objects can appear wavy or, or distorted uh, in the presence of cystoid macular edema. And these are usually treated with um, anti-inflammatory eye drops, the steroid eye drops, as well as some other eye drops called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory um, eye drops. Um, this usually occurs uh, if it is to happen a few weeks after cataract surgery, uh, and usually with just the eye drops alone, um, this can resolve over the course uh, of a few weeks. Um, and I wanted to briefly discuss um, some complications that patients who undergo a combined corneal transplant and cataract surgery can face. Uh, and one of those complications is rejection. Uh, and so um, when we put the um, so when we put the lens in the eye, this is usually made of a sort of a plastic material. And so the body um, does not attack, um, you know, the lens that we put in the eye. But when we put a, um, a corneal transplant on the eye, uh, on the other hand, that's a living tissue. And so the immune cells of the body can sometimes get wired up and can attack the uh, transplanted graft. And this can cause the vision uh, to become cloudy and hazy. Uh, and so you can kind of see uh, in this graph that it's not entirely clear uh, compared to some of the pictures that we saw earlier. Uh, and this is usually treated with um, steroid uh, eye drops to decrease inflammation and um, prevent the immune system from attacking the, um, the uh, transplanted cornea. Now, patients who have had a corneal transplant um, who undergo cataract surgery, because of the inflammation in the eye, there can be a slightly higher risk um, of, of rejection, but usually um, pretty uh, well controlled with just the eye drops alone. 
Um, infection can also occur after a um, corneal transplant. It's very uncommon to have um, an infection in the cornea after just a standalone cataract surgery, um, but in the um, transplanted cornea, there can be a higher risk of infection. And so that's what that little white area is um, in the cornea. And this is usually caused by bacteria, sometimes other organisms like fungus, and we treat these with um, antibiotic eye drops to uh, eliminate the bacteria, and that allows the eye to heal um, normally. Now, after standalone cataract surgery, there can be risks of infection in the eye itself, but those are usually very, very rare, one in several thousand. So it's not something that we see often uh, with just standalone cataract surgery. Um, glaucoma is a complication that can occur um, after corneal transplant especially. Um, it can occur in some patients after regular cataract surgery, but it's uh, not, not terribly common. Uh, glaucoma is when there's damage to the nerve in the eye from high pressure inside of the eye. Uh, and this is more common after a corneal transplant, and we treat this with eye drops to uh, decrease the eye pressure uh, and rarely surgery. And so this is why it's important uh, after any surgery, but especially after a corneal transplant, to uh, regularly follow up with your surgeon to monitor uh, for uh, complications like these. Um, now, overall, um, patients who have uh, cataract surgery, whether or not they have keratoconus, whether or not they're having a combined procedure or standalone cataract surgery um, can expect to have um, really a, a big improvement um, in vision. And you know, the combination of removing the cloudy lens, helping to correct some of the glasses prescription um, with the new lens implant, and then potentially the use of um, contact lenses afterwards, um, all of these things kind of work together to help to really um, improve the vision. Um, in patients with keratoconus who undergo um, cataract surgery. For patients who undergo corneal transplants, um, there's um, very good um, long-term success of those procedures uh, as well. Um, so I think that's uh, all we have, and um, I just wanted to um, thank everyone so much, and thank you all for your time and attention. Well, thank you guys for those outstanding presentations. That was excellent. I did want to just emphasize a couple of points before we open things up for questions. Um, one is um, Dr. Naidu talked a bit about the, the triple procedure, the combined corneal transplant and cataract. Um, from a surgeon's perspective, that's always a tough call to determine which patients would be the best candidates for that. And for those of you who may be in that situation where cataract surgery is pending, it's really a, a discussion you have to have with your surgeon. I mean, as a general rule, if the cornea has a lot of thinning, a lot of scarring, then the patient probably would benefit from the triple procedure. On the other hand, if the cornea, despite having keratoconus, remains relatively clear, then most of the time the patient can have just cataract surgery alone without having to have the, the combined corneal transplant. The other point I wanted to make was in terms of the uh, toric intraocular lens, the astigmatism correcting intraocular lens. That's also a situation where it's a tough call as to uh, whether that's a good idea to use in a keratoconus patient or not. And every surgeon is gonna have um, their own uh, policy on that, their own thoughts on that. The way that I do it is patients who are already in a contact lens for their keratoconus and we expect that they're going to continue to be in the contact lens for keratoconus, I will not put in the, the toric lens because it really doesn't gain them anything because their astigmatism is gonna be corrected with the contact lens. On the other hand, keratoconus patients who are in glasses, and generally those are glasses that have a lot of astigmatism correction in them, can benefit greatly from using a toric intraocular lens to try to reduce the astigmatism as much as we can at the time of surgery. So with that, um, Dr. Lee, do we have some questions? Yeah, I think you guys gave a really great talk because we have a lot of questions. All right, so um, I'm gonna kind of go in chronological order of the talk. So with the advent of scleral lenses, quickly, at least in the optometry world, we're seeing that that's the most common lens that's being fit on our patients with irregular cornea. What's the recommended contact lens holiday for a scleral lens wearer? So I, I haven't had a different policy with those than I've had for the RGP. So uh, a minimum of three weeks before we do the measurements for the cataract surgery. And probably the most common question I get in clinic when I tell the patients they need a holiday is, 
well, I need my contacts to function and go to work. So what do you guys usually recommend to your patients when they say that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's a patient who can't get by wearing glasses for that period of time, then sometimes what we'll do is just measure one eye at a time. So have them go without one lens for those three weeks, measure that eye. They can then put the lens back in that eye, take the other one out for three weeks and then measure that one. It's, it's cumbersome, but, but that's certainly a way around that. Yeah, so um, one way around that one person was wondering is, can you do cataract surgery at both eyes, in both eyes at the same time? So it's a good question. So can that be done? Yes. Is it done very often? No. And the reason that we very rarely do that is because of some of the, the risks that Dr. El Sarag was talking about. So particularly infection. So if you know you have one of those rare one in 10,000 cases where there's an infection inside the eye after cataract surgery, you do not under any circumstances want to have that in both eyes at the same time because it can be a really devastating complication to have. So for safety reasons, almost always we'll do just one eye at a time. Do you have a preference for which eye you do? I feel like with keratoconus, because it's so asymmetric sometimes, I'm always curious if the surgeon, you know, does the worst eye or the better eye. So I almost always we do the worst eye first. Occasionally there are situations where a patient asks to do the better eye first to get back to their, their functioning as quickly as possible. But almost always we do the worst eye first. For us, I agree totally. Um, I'm glad you guys touched on the triple procedure. I think when I was shadowing, they called it like the open sky procedure. And we've had a lot of questions about that. So if somebody already had a cornea transplant and now they're getting cataract surgery, is there any risk that they need to be aware of? Another really good question. So, so the answer is yes, actually. So the, the main thing being that Anytime we do cataract surgery, even the most beautifully performed cataract surgery that you can do, there's going to be inflammation in the eye afterwards. Anytime you're generating inflammation in someone who's had a corneal transplant, there is the small chance that that could trigger a rejection. Thankfully, that's quite rare, but I've certainly seen cases where, where that has happened, that cataract surgery has ultimately triggered a rejection of a transplant. Other than that, um, the, the technique that we use to remove the cataract in someone who has an existing transplant is a little different, but it's just a it's just a subtle change. We make the incision in a slightly different location in those patients, but um, but infection, I mean, a rejection is really the the main concern. So, in the um, to play like devil's advocate, in the opposite scenario, let's say someone has avoided. Uh, PKs or, you know, corneal transplant their whole life, now they are undergoing cataract surgery. Is a cornea transplant a possible complication after cataract surgery? Related to the keratoconus, no. So there are some rare cases where if you have complications at the time of cataract surgery, it can cause swelling of the cornea, which can ultimately lead to, to the need for a corneal transplant but that's no more or less likely in, in someone with keratoconus than anybody else. So when we are talking about swelling, because I think one of the big things that we kind of uh, worried about all the time, especially with scleral lens wear, is are we affecting the intraocular pressure of the eye? How do you guys accurately measure IOP in your advanced keratoconus patients, especially when there's like swelling it there too? Well, there are a variety of ways. I'm not sure how accurate any of them really are. Um, you know, there, there are a variety of things like a, an eye care or a tono pen that often is, are helpful in patients who have very irregular corneas where we can't use the normal device that we use typically to, to check the pressure. But it's, it's, a, it's a tough problem because sometimes we're, we're never completely sure if it is 100% accurate in those patients. So how does the like pneumotonometer compare to like the eye care or the tono pen? You know, I, that I can't answer. I haven't used a pneumotonometer in probably 30 years. <laughs> so I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. You stop that me. Is, it comes to mind because that was the go-to uh, piece of equipment we used 
at UCSF and it always made that like and yeah, it's, yeah, I'm just like, okay, good to know that we are, uh, you know, using more high tech things now. Yeah, no, um, it, and it's been pretty well replaced by the the eye care and the tono pen. Oh, perfect. So there are a few concerns about, you know, lens power selection. So if the wrong power lens is inserted and the patient can't see well, can the lens ever be replaced? It can, but that is another whole surgery with you know, the same potential risks as the initial surgery. Mm -hmm. So can that be done? Yes, but we, we prefer to avoid that. And there are in some patients ways around that one being a contact lens uh, mm -hmm. to correct the vision rather than, than putting a new lens in and the others in, in some patients and, you know, obviously in, in keratoconus patients, less of an option, but in other patients, we can do refractive surgery like uh, LASIK or PRK like some people get just to reduce their nearsightedness, we can also use that in that situation where the power of the of the lens is off. But yes, going back in surgically is an option as well. What are your thoughts on the, because, you know, if we can't replace the lens, um, maybe we can change the lens power. So like these new light activated IOLs, what are your thoughts on those for irregular cornea patients? Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't had much experience or read much about in, in keratoconus patients specifically with that light adjustable lens, mm -hmm. but intuitively knowing the, the concept, the theory behind it, I think it actually makes a lot of sense. D downsides to that lens, one is you, you do have to pay out of pocket for it, so it's a pretty significant expense. Mm -hmm. And secondly, there are a lot of post-operative visits involved in order to, to make those adjustments to the lens. So you have to, as a patient, you have to be prepared that those first few months, you're going to be in the doctor's office a lot working on that. Yeah. But From at least I in theory, I, I think it's, it's a, a reasonable, very reasonable option. Yeah. I think from what I understand is they can change the power of the lens up to three times before it's like fully locked in. Correct. And I think that you have like a three month time span to do that. Correct. That's right. Awesome. That's, yeah, that sounds like a lot of visits. Um, it is a lot of visits. <laughs> in your experience, what percentage of your keratoconus patients actually undergo the triple procedure? Th thankfully, not that many. Um, so, you know, often patients with keratoconus, if their cone is going to get really bad and thinned and scarred, tends to often happen when they're a little bit on the younger side. So before they really started to develop cataracts, so they would have a straight PK. Flip side, when people get to their 60s and 70s, the typical age when cataracts develop, usually by then uh, their keratoconus has stabilized and often isn't at the point, never will get to the point that it needs to have a transplant. So it's le less common to need the triple procedure than, than one or the other alone. So for the patients that maybe weren't cross-linking candidates, do you feel like their cornea changes at all after cataract surgery? No, I haven't really experienced that. Temporarily, you can see some shifts, but more long-term, no, no, that's not something that, that I typically see. And um, one other person did ask, in your experience, how many or I guess what percentage of your keratoconus patients tend to have complications after cataract surgery? Very few, very few. It's, it's basically the same as the general population. And usually we, we quote in terms of any type of problem postoperatively is one to 2%. Mm -hmm. A more serious kind of problem is in the one in five to 10,000 range and, and really no, no different in the keratoconus patients. You know, I'd love to get your thoughts, Dr. Lesbader, on um, intacts. I mean, is that something you guys perform at your clinic? Do you feel like it's helpful for this patient population? So it's not not something I've ever done. I'm familiar with it, but not something that I've ever done. You know, I, I've I've usually found that either people at, in this day and age are good cross-linking ca candidates, so they don't really need to have the intacts, or they're too far gone and the cornea is too thin to be able to insert them. So it's certainly a, a, an option for, for a, a certain segment of the population, but that's not something that I've ever done. 
I would um, 100% agree with you. As a contact lens fitter and specialist, it's really hard to fit a lens on a cornea that has intacts there. I think of them like little speed bumps. And I bet. I'm seeing these OCTs and you're like, oh my gosh, the tissue is so thin over this intact. Like, okay, uh, it's concerning. Um, so in those patients that do have intacts though, can you still perform cataract surgery on them? You can, you can. You just have to take the, the altered shape of the cornea into account when you're trying to do those calculations to determine the correct lens power, but you can. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, you guys. It was a really uh, exciting talk. I think I finally got through all the questions. The audience clearly had a lot um, on their mind. And we will see you all hopefully on May 14th for the next NKCF webinar. Um, the title is Systems and Solutions for Your Contact Lenses uh, by Dr. Susan Gramacki. And again, thank you guys for joining us tonight. Have a good rest of your day. Okay, th thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.